Hello, and welcome to The More Perfect Union, the podcast that offers real debate without the hate. But on this podcast, there may not be much debate at all, because today it's just me, Kevin Kelton, speaking to you by myself in what I hope will be considered a special podcast. It's an interim podcast until next week, when Greg Ward and I convene again to do our official return from our summer hiatus. But before then, there were some things I had on my chest and my mind that I wanted to get out into the public arena about some of the stuff that we've been following in the news these past few weeks while we've been off having fun during our summer. So first of all, let me tell you that I had a great summer. Jess and I did some traveling, including going to uh, Northern California to visit her parents in Mendocino, which is a beautiful area right on the coast of uh, the Pacific. Uh, They have an unbelievable house there right on a bluff overlooking the Pacific Ocean, and we had a great time there. Also had some good meals there and in San Francisco, and we've also been doing the other typical things that people do during the summer. But that said, let's get to the heart of the news. I want to talk a little bit about all of the criticism that is being thrown at the Biden administration not just from the right, where we would expect it, but frankly from some on the left who think that the Biden administration has somehow massively mishandled the Afghanistan pullout, and in some cases they seem to be blaming the entire failure of Afghanistan on Joe Biden, who inherited this war about 20 years after it started, maybe 19 years after it started. So let's go back and look at what happened in the last seven or eight months when the Biden administration first took responsibility for the Afghanistan war and the Afghan pullout. Now, as everyone knows, and I'm not telling you anything new, the Trump administration negotiated a deal directly with the Taliban, leaving out the Afghan government, to create a date certain for pullout of all American forces from Afghanistan And that date was supposed to be at the end of March of 2021. Now, first of all, let's make something clear, because I've seen a lot of people talking about this on Facebook and bloviating about it, and they don't know the reality. The deal was all American and allied forces, all coalition forces were coming out of Afghanistan. There was to be no residual force. The president of the United States Donald Trump signed that deal with the Taliban, and it therefore became a legal negotiated peace treaty. Call it what you want. That's a legal document that the United States was obligated to adhere to. Otherwise, they would be breaking international law. Okay. Now we know that, yes, when the Biden administration came into office, they actually did not meet the March deadline to pull out. They decided they needed more time to put together an adequate pull-out plan. So Biden goes to his generals, not just the Secretary of Defense, but to the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the commanders on the ground in Afghanistan and in theater. And they also had the... um, the State Department and diplomats on both sides of the world, hundreds if not thousands of people working on this plan to, as safely as possible, draw down all U.S. troops from Afghanistan. Now, the right paints a picture, or they have since the tragedy of the 13 Americans being killed in the suicide bombing, the right is painting this picture of an addle-brained president waking up one day in August and saying, okay, time to get them out. Let's just pull them all out. I don't care how you do it. And not having any command of the situation, giving orders that defied logic, that he was somehow weak, that he was somehow only reactive. None of that is true. And if you're like me and you're being besieged with relatives, friends on Facebook, friends that you meet in the real world, 
who are saying, oh, Biden blew it. The whole thing was botched. They had no plan. Believe me, they had a plan. And all of these armchair generals who are sitting in the comfort of their own homes, or in some cases sitting in the front seat of their cars making little videos saying how they would have done it differently and they would have done it better, they don't know what the F they're talking about. You know that's true. I know it's true. And they know it's true. Most of them have never even served a day in the military. So for people to start pretending that they knew how to get out of Afghanistan with zero loss of life or leaving zero Americans or zero allies of ours behind, it's just plain bullshit. And I don't care whether it's it's coming from a U.S. senator, a U.S. congressman, somebody who was in the service before, someone who's still in the service. They have no idea what the realities were, or if they do, they're lying to you because it's just not the case that there was no plan or that the plan fell apart somehow. So let's go back and see what exactly did happen. Biden, first of all, he campaigned on the promise of pulling all troops out of Afghanistan. And as I'm sure you know, even when he was vice president, he was against all escalations of troop levels in Afghanistan. He specifically advised Obama against the 40,000 men or the 40,000 troop surge that Obama actually did on the advice of the generals. And quite frankly, I think it was one of the biggest mistakes of the Obama administration. But Biden advised strongly against that. He has, since sometime in 2003 or 2004, been consistent in his belief that while we were right to go in there to pursue al-Qaeda and to pursue Osama bin Laden, that there had been mission creep, that we had lost the focus of the mission, and that to stay there ongoing and needlessly, there was no reason for it. So he has been a consistent voice since the early 2000s on the need to come up with a withdrawal plan that could safely get us unengaged from this unwinnable war. So what happens? He says to his generals, to his secretary of state, to his secretary of defense, and to all of his advisors, I want all American troops out by 9-11. I want to bring an end to this war by the anniversary, the 20-year anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. Now, you may say that was an arbitrary deadline. The generals actually said to him, and, and I read some articles, I can name the names, but a group of generals did say to him in April of, the, of 2021 that they felt that the United States should keep a contingency force of about 2,500 to 4,000 troops in Afghanistan as a counterinsurgents presence and to try to help the Afghani government maintain stability for as long as they can. Now, if you agreed with those generals that we should have continued the war and not drawn down, well, then you and I have an honest difference of opinion as to what the right move was for this president. But I think most people, I actually think probably over 80% of, of the American public, thinks that getting out of Afghanistan this year was the right call. So let's accept that premise. The generals said, as they always do to every president, we think we need to stay there longer. We think the mission isn't done. Let us just keep a minimal presence of 2,500 or 3,500 or 4,000 troops there, and we will help maintain the Afghanistan government uh, from collapsing to the Taliban. The president heard them out. It was debated not just by him and a couple of generals, but throughout the national security apparatus of the United States. And the judgment was made that no, the time had finally come to draw down. So he gives his generals and his defense department an order. Come up with a plan. Let's approve that plan. And then let's execute that plan to get everyone out safely before 9-11. So the defense department comes up with a plan. Now, part of that plan was deciding 
how to utilize the limited forces that were in country to safely defend the U.S. Embassy for as long as we needed it and to organize and execute a withdrawal that not only got our troops out, but got out American citizens who wanted to leave and those Afghanis who were helpful to us during the 20-year war and might be in jeopardy, and obviously are in jeopardy, if they stayed in the country and the Taliban were to identify them. So when you're doing something like that, you have to put together a plan that weighs the manpower you have, the resources you have, the objective that you want, and the best way to get there. Part of that was deciding what to defend and what not to defend. Now, you've probably heard a lot of discussion about Bagram Air Force Base. So you'll hear a lot of conservatives who are lambasting the Biden administration for abandoning Bagram Air Force Base and leaving all this equipment behind. They're both, if not lies, they're misstatements of what actually happened. The Pentagon looked at what do we need and where do we need to be to effectively organize this pullout, this airlift. And they felt that Bagram, which is 50 miles away from Kabul, was not a strategic location that was worth keeping. They looked at it. They studied it. It wasn't as if somebody said, ah, let's just get the heck out of there. They weighed the strategic and the tactical implications for keeping Bagram going and trying to defend it, and it was a much larger air force airfield than Kabul airport. Therefore, it needed a much larger military presence to defend it. And they felt that it was located in a place that strategically made it harder for people to get there to be airlifted out because it was 50 miles outside of Kabul, and it was where there really wasn't much of a military presence of the Afghan army, but there were warlords and potentially Taliban fighters who would be in that area, making it harder for people to get to Bagram. So General Milley and the commanders on the ground in Afghanistan, the CENTCOM commanders who knew Afghanistan best, made an educated judgment that it made sense to leave Bagram early and just focus on Kabul airport. And that's what they did. Now, a lot of people say, oh, they left in the middle of the night. They didn't even tell the Afghan government they were leaving. Yes, because that's the safest way to get out of there. You don't want to tip people off that you're leaving a strategic military location in broad daylight. They'll shoot the planes out of the sky. These people have surface-to-air missiles, shoulder-held surface-to-air missiles. They also have rifles and M16s and other high-powered weaponry. You tell them that you're putting all of your men on a plane and getting out of there, they'll start shooting at them. So yes, you don't announce a date certain for something like that. You do it on your timetable secretly and quite often in the dark of night so as to avoid the types of problems that we ended up having in Kabul. Now, there's some talk about, well, they left a lot of equipment on the ground in, in, at uh, Bagram Air Force Base. Actually, they either made that, that equipment inoperable or actively destroyed it before leaving. So that's another lie that you've been told by the critics of this administration. And as far as us leaving billions and billions of dollars behind for the Taliban, that is not what happened. The United States spent 20 years trying to build up the Afghan military so it could stand on its own. That was the goal of the Bush administration. That was the goal of the Obama administration. That was the goal of the Trump administration. Almost 20 years we've been building up this military. And it doesn't just mean soldiers on the ground. It means air support. It means equipment. It means tanks. It means artillery. And yes, we gave all of those things to the Afghan government so they could have a military to defend the country. We didn't leave it for the Taliban. 
it was given, sometimes paid for, sometimes as not a gift, but given to our allies in Afghanistan so they could defend themselves, just as we do with dozens and dozens of countries across Europe and in South America. The problem was that the Afghan army folded like a cheap piece of aluminum foil pretty much as soon as they knew we were, uh, we were pulling out of the country. That was unanticipated. Now, I'm not going to get into that just yet. We'll talk about whether we should have anticipated uh, how quickly they were going to fall later in this conversation. But I just want to make the focus of my comment here very clear. We did not abandon military equipment to be left for the Taliban. We left military equipment for the Afghans, and the Afghans lost that in battle or just walked away from it. And that's how it fell into the hands of the Taliban. Now, you might think that that's a semantic difference. Well, that's your opinion. In my mind, that's a very big difference than saying we just left equipment for the Taliban. It was supposed to be left there to maintain the Afghan government. The Afghan government screwed up. Okay, now let's talk again about what happened in the final days. So, we drew down our presence to about 2,500 men, as, as I understand it, and began planning. And this planning started in April, not just in early August, as some people say, oh, all of a sudden they decided they had to get out of there. No, the planning for the drawdown started in April. And as early as mid-May, the United States uh, State Department was sending messages, public messages, to all Americans in Afghanistan that our presence in Afghanistan was coming to an end and these people should make plans to get out as soon as possible. So I'm going to jump ahead now to this idea that, well, we left 100 or 200 Americans behind. It's not like these people were not given any notice that this was coming. These were all Americans who knew They should have known, actually, when the Trump administration negotiated the deal with the Taliban to leave, but certainly had to know in May when the State Department was publicly telling them, it's time for you to make plans now to get out of the country sooner rather than later, that they should make some plans and get the hell out of there, or at least be prepared to evacuate when the time came. Listen, I'm not blaming those people for being left there. But I'm also not blaming the Biden administration because these people did not take the adequate planning and precautions to be ready to evacuate when the time came or have a plan to get to Kabul airport. Okay, so they start to plan an organized pullout that was going to use Kabul airport as the chosen and designated location for the airlift. They knew it was going to be many tens of thousands, as it turned out to be over 120,000 people were going to need to be airlifted out of Afghanistan. And they planned it. So anyone that tells you they didn't have a plan doesn't know what they're talking about or is, again, just bullshitting you. They had a plan. They began to put it into motion. The problem is the United States government and all of the intelligence that the CIA, the NSA, All of the intelligence departments put together led to the conclusion that it was likely that the Afghan army could hold on for weeks or months or possibly years before either a coalition government was formed with the Taliban or the Afghan army was going to fall. No one anticipated that the Afghan army was going to be able to hold that country forever. That we knew. What we didn't know was just how badly their generals would screw up, abandon their posts. Uh, We didn't expect Ghani, the president, to hightail it out of the country in the middle of the night. A lot of these things, it just happened. It just happened. I read one story that said that Ghani had planned to stay And then his people came and said, hey, we've got some intelligence that the Taliban is coming. They're going to behead you and, you know, and rip your, your, your guts out in the street for public consumption, just like they've done to previous presidents when they've taken over. Uh, And we don't want that for you. You better get on a plane now 
And he did. He listened to his advisors and he hightailed it. Anyways, when word of that got out, the generals, you know, they got weak need and they probably didn't command their their platoons and their troops as well as could be expected. And the entire military collapsed. Or these people made the judgment that if America's leaving and if our president has already left the country, I'm not going to do hand-to-hand battle or gun-to-gun battle with other Muslims. I'm just going to lay down my gun and go home. I, I don't need this if there's no government to protect. Regardless of why they did it, it happened. It wasn't anticipated. The intelligence, and again, you could say it was an intelligence failure. That's fair. You can't point that or you can't blame that on Joe Biden. He's not the head of the CIA. Yes, the head of the CIA reports to him, but he doesn't control the entire intel apparatus of the United States. He has to rely on their competence. And in this case, they either were mistaken or they were incompetent. They did not anticipate the fall as quickly as it happened of the Afghan army. So once we got there and there was no Afghan army, and the Taliban was pretty much rolling through city after city, well, then you had to change the plans and and (laughs) pick the pace up a little bit. And that's what they did. So you now have tens of thousands of people convening in and around Kabul Air Base, and they want out of the country. And it makes sense. They realized that they were going to be going back to pre-2001 Taliban rule, And anyone who's sane doesn't want to live under those circumstances. So the American military did the best it could to process those people, to get the ones that should be on planes into the airport, and to keep those who either didn't belong in the airlift or, frankly, might have been hostile to the United States and our allies from getting on our planes and coming into our countries. In that process... Tragically, a suicide bomber blended in with the crowd, got up to what we might call the gate or the checkpoint or whatever the processing center was or whatever it looked like. Nobody's quite sure at this point. But they got up to where a group, a large contingent of U.S. military was checking the papers and processing people that wanted into the airport, and he blew himself up. And he killed 13 U.S. service people and scores over 100 Afghanis. And it's a horrible, horrible tragedy of war. But to say that that is blood on Joe Biden's hands is ridiculous. It's a war zone. There have been hundreds of explosions in Afghanistan, if not thousands, since the war began. IEDs suicide bombers, planned attacks. You've read about them over the course of the, of the war, if not monthly, sometimes weekly, but several times a year. You would hear about a police station. Somebody walked in and blew him or herself up. You would hear about a wedding where there was a suicide bomber that exploded the whole freaking thing. You'd hear about it at military checkpoints, It happens, and it's not just a product of this war. Folks, it happened to Ronald Reagan in Beirut, 241 Marines blown up inside their own compound. It happened, well, not a suicide bombing, but Pan Am 103 blown out of the sky over Scotland with a surface-to-air missile. It happened in Somalia, where a group of Marines were pinned down, Black Hawk down, we've all heard about that, and I think the number was approximately 20 U.S. service people were lost in a battle that no one anticipated. It happened in Fallujah when the Bush administration was in power, and a military screw-up led to a group of, of U.S. service people being slaughtered in the streets of Fallujah and four of them being hung from trees after you know being killed and burned. We all remember those images. They're all tragic. They're all horrible. We wish we could avoid them. It's war. That's what happens in war. So if you're blaming Biden for this, it's like blaming Harry Truman for World War II. 
It's like blaming Gerald Ford for Vietnam because he happened to be the president during the final days of the Saigon airlift, where everything went bad. Okay? Biden inherited this mess. I'm not saying that he's blameless because, frankly, he was a vice president of the United States for eight years. But it's not all on him. It was a, it was a clusterfuck from top to bottom, and there's plenty of blame to go around. But trying to say that one president is somehow at fault for trying to get us out of this war just ignores the reality of what the war was. You know, I want to backtrack. I I don't want to blame Donald Trump for what went down. Donald Trump has enough things in history to take full credit and blame for that I don't need to add more onto his list. But I want to point out that when he was president, there was an, an attack on U.S. service troops in Syria, and he responded by assassinating Iranian General Soleimani. And the right thought it was the greatest thing. They thought it was even better than when we got bin Laden. Uh, you know, he had found this this general who was, uh, you know, believed to be behind many, many organized terrorist attacks against the United States and our interests, and he had blown him out of the streets of Iran. Fine. Well, once we were attacked and the, and the servicemen were blown up by the suicide bomber in Kabul, It took less than 48 hours for the Biden administration and the CIA and the other intelligence agencies that we had there and the other intelligence assets that we had there to identify who the bombers were, identify who had planned it, and kill him. Less than 48 hours it took them to do that. And then, within a day after that, they identified two more bombers who had a a huge amount of explosives in their car and were on their way to attempt a second attack on Kabul airport, and we blew them to heaven. Now, unfortunately, because we had to do it on the streets of uh, Afghanistan and because they happened to be in traffic and because their car happened to have a significant amount of munitions in it because they were on their way to blow up U.S. troops, When that car blew up thanks to a drone airstrike, a car nearby with 10 people on board, including several children, was also blown up and there was a loss of life there, civilian casualties. Again, an unfortunate product of war. But which would you have rather had, those unfortunate casualties or a second suicide bombing back at Kabul airport a day or two later? Let's be real, folks. You cannot stop a suicide bombing. I mean, in this case, yes, We had the intelligence, and we were able to actually intercept and kill some potential bombers before they reached their target. But suicide bombings are the hardest thing in the world to defend against. And keeping Bagram Air Force Base was not going to stop a suicide bomber from attacking Kabul Air Force Base 50 miles away. So again, people who made the argument we should have held on to Bagram, it had nothing to do with what happened we would have had to have defended two airports instead of one. We would have had more exposed targets, not less. We wouldn't have been safer. We would have been less safe if we had held on to Bagram. That's why the general said we only need one airfield to get people out. Now, finally, I want to address this idea that, well, there were still Americans in country. The Biden administration should have extended the deadline past August 31st. I hear that a lot, and I hear it from people in the news that, frankly, I used to respect a lot more until they put forth this theory. Here's the problem with that. Again, they're not thinking like military people, and they're not taking in the realities on the ground. Here are the realities on the ground as they were in the days prior to August 31st. There had been talk in the press about the possibility of extending. Famously, George Stephanopoulos asked President Biden directly in an ABC News interview about that possibility. And the president would not say yes, he would not say no. Once it got out, it was floating in the zeitgeist, 
that the United States might extend past August 31st. The Taliban immediately went on record saying, no, we're not for that. That was not the agreement that we came to with the United States. We will not stand for that. We want all U.S. and allied forces out of our country on the date that they said they would leave. Now, you might say, well, who are they to tell us what to do? We're the United States of America. They're just the tiddly Taliban. And if we wanted to stay longer, screw them. Now, let's look at that. Here's the problem. To get the last of your forces out of country, to get the last of your forces out of Kabul airport, you need some kind of ground security to create a perimeter so that those planes are not shot out of the sky. That ground security was being provided by the Taliban. They created a perimeter around the airport in the final days so that we could get the last flights out. Because at a certain point, you listen, you've got, you've got troops that are guarding the airport and you get the last of your ground troops onto a C-130 or a C-19 and you get them in the air. Then you have to pull those troops into the airport and you have to start getting them out. Until you get down to the last plane load, let's say it's about 200, and there's nobody else on the perimeter other than the Taliban. Without them, those last planes going out, it would have been a turkey shoot. Anyone with a surface-to-air missile, with a shoulder-held surface-to-air missile weapon, anyone with, with machine guns, could have shot those planes out of the sky. And wouldn't that have been the ultimate tragedy and tragic way to end the war? With a C-130 being shot out of the sky as 200 servicemen perished in a fiery crash on the last day of the war. Wouldn't that have been the ultimate defeat in Afghanistan? Biden didn't want that. Nobody wants that. You didn't want that. Well, to avoid that, you needed the help of the Taliban. Like it or not, you cannot pull out of a country in a war zone with several enemy factions without some security around the airport. Now, you'll say, well, okay, why couldn't they have done that in the first week of September, the second week of September? Because the Taliban isn't stupid. They threw back channels, and I will guarantee you this. Have I read it? Have I seen it someplace? No. But I will guarantee you that at some point it will come out that the Taliban said, if you still have people in country after midnight on September 1st, you're on your own. We're not providing security around the airport. And frankly, we can't promise that one of our you know, warlords won't take his own pot shot because you've got a country that now is going to be factionalized. The Taliban is not just one organization. It's numerous little groups of warlords that operate independently of each other with some, you know, agreement about philosophy of Islam and the philosophy of governing the country. But one of these warlords might have thought, you know, the way for me to really establish myself as a kingpin here is to be the guy that takes down the the last C-130 of the United States going out of country. And there's no way to protect against that unless you have some organized security force on the ground for those last planes to leave. So like I said, without that, if we had stayed another week, yes, maybe we would have gotten another 50 or 100 or 200 U.S. citizens out of the country. Maybe. Frankly, the the Pentagon doesn't believe that even if they had stayed an extra three or four weeks, they could have gotten everybody there and on a plane. But even if you believe that that was possible, you still would have had the situation that the last flights to take U.S. military personnel out of country, those flights would have been in grave danger. And if the second to last one gets shot down, then what happens to that final 100, 150, 200 U.S. service people who are in Kabul airport waiting to get on the next plane? They're not going to get on another plane knowing that the one before them just got shot out of the sky with a SAM missile. 
So now they're hostages in, in Afghanistan. They're hostages inside Kabul airport. What do you do then? Now you've got a situation that's worse than the Iran hostage crisis in 1980. So all of these things had to be thought through at the highest levels of government, at the highest levels of military planning, just to avoid a tragedy 10 times greater than the one that, yes, we did suffer when we lost 13 service people. So I'm not minimizing the loss of life, and I'm not saying that there might have been some, you know, obviously anytime a bomb gets close enough to go off and kill that many people, something went wrong. But do you blame that on the commander-in-chief? You know, in Israel, there have been in history, as you know, hundreds and hundreds of suicide bombings. A bus gets blown up. A cafe gets blown up. A military outpost gets blown up. In Israel, they don't immediately turn on the prime minister. They blame the terrorists. They don't blame the prime minister for a terrorist suicide attack because everybody knows you can't defend against them. Now, yes, if you have specific, detailed intelligence ahead of time, like we had before 9-11, then a case can be made that the commanders screwed up. But as of yet, to my knowledge, there is no record of there having been intel ahead of time of a specific credible threat to that location at that airport at that day that could have been deterred. So with that in mind, I just want to say again, there's plenty of blame to go around from presidents to generals to diplomats through four different administrations. And frankly, I have blame to go back into the George H.W. Bush administration because he cozied up to the Taliban and to the Reagan administration, who, as everybody should know, created the Taliban when we built up the Mujahideen. So there's plenty of blame historically to go around for what happened in Afghanistan and what a tragic shitload of events it turned out to be for the United States. But to try to focus our ire on one president because he was the one who had the balls to actually say it's time to end this thing is, in my opinion, wildly unfair and, frankly, at odds with the facts of history. Now, I've been going on for a long time. I really thought this was going to be a very short podcast, and I've rambled on almost as long as I do with my friends. And if you're listening, Greg and Ward, I can't wait to to talk about a lot of this with you guys next week. But I want to spend the last couple of minutes talking about the uh, latest travesty in the news, which is that the Texas abortion ban has been allowed to stay in effect in Texas because the Supreme Court voted five to four not to stay the law, which means to put the law on hold until they adjudicate it. A lot of my friends are sending me messages now, you know, what do you think of your beloved Texas now? Well, first of all, of course, look, like anybody who believes in reproductive rights, I'm horrified at the the way things are working out. But to blame Texas is, again, I think, a misfocus of whatever anger you want to project onto this very unfortunate historic turn of events. Because the Texas law, as dumb as it is, and I can't imagine a law that's dumber than giving regular citizens standing to sue other citizens for somehow participating in or abetting an abortion. Well, let's all stipulate that that's just insane, okay? And the Texas legislature came up with it, and the Texas governor signed it. That's all insane. But there are numerous, numerous test cases. I don't know whether it's 12 or 15 or 18, but numerous states have created numerous laws to be test cases that can get to the Supreme Court so that we can put Roe versus Wade on the stand. Everybody knows that. And everybody knows that with this court, thanks to the three justices appointed by Donald Trump, that Roe doesn't stand a chance. And they've now pretty much telegraphed that this week by letting this crazy law stand. Because their job is, 
when there is a law that violates standing law, standing constitutional law, a standing U.S. Supreme Court precedent, when a state creates a new law like that, the court is supposed to stay the law, put it on hold, until it is reviewed in the courts. That's their job. But what they did was, they said, no, we're not even going to wait to review it. We're going to let this thing go into law now. That tells you that five justices are ready to overturn Roe today, before it's even been argued before them. So, listen, God love you. If you live in California and you hate everything between New York and California, or you know, if you're just one of those people that thinks that anybody that lives in the South is just a cowboy and a redneck and a kook, fine. I moved here. I've met wonderful people here, some who share my political ideology, some who don't share my political ideology. And yes, Texans elected Greg Abbott and they elected the Republican legislature. And I'm not happy with either of them. But to put this all on Texas is missing the greater point. Roe versus Wade was destined to die the day that Ruth Bader Ginsburg died. You knew it then, you know it now. We all knew it. And as soon as we knew that Amy Coney Barrett was his appointee to the Supreme Court, we knew that Roe was dead in the water. If you didn't, You were naive. You were fooling yourself. And frankly, if you want to blame someone for the fact that within a year or two, abortion may not be legal any place in the United States, or it may be left to the states to cobble together their own abortion laws, which will divide the country even further into those that allow abortions and those that effectively don't. And boy, will that create more of a divide in this country than we already have. But if you want to blame someone for that, blame the liberal Democrats, or for that matter, any Democrat who knew who Donald Trump was in his soul before the 2016 election and made an evaluation that they were either going to not vote for Hillary Clinton, not vote at all, or vote for Jill Stein as some kind of a protest vote. And there were over a million, there were, I think, 1.7 million votes for Jill Stein. Now, not all of them were in swing states, but there were enough in the swing states to tip that election. And when you add on people that simply didn't vote because they just didn't like Hillary and didn't want to vote for her, you people were told, I told you, the media told you, Hillary Clinton told you, Bernie Sanders told you, everyone told you that any vote that didn't go to Hillary Clinton was a vote for Donald Trump and was a vote for a 5-4 or a 6-3 Supreme Court. We told you, you still voted for Jill Stein, or you still stayed home, or maybe you, you held your nose and you voted for Hillary Clinton, but in the months leading up to the election, you barraged your Facebook, and your Twitter pages with anti-Hillary crap that got into the zeitgeist that led other people to withhold their vote from her. Those are the people, and I'll speak to you directly if you're one of them, you are the person who is responsible for losing Roe versus Wade. So again, we want to blame Joe Biden. You want to blame Donald Trump. You want to blame Texans. Have at it. History will judge you, the people that helped elect Donald Trump by not voting for Hillary Clinton in Michigan, in Wisconsin, and in Pennsylvania, and frankly, every place else, because I don't buy that bullshit of, well, I'm in a deep blue state, my vote doesn't really make a difference. That's a bullshit excuse. If you lived in California and New York, and you still voted for Jill Stein, or you still didn't go to the polls, you still bear responsibility. We're losing Roe versus Wade, not because of Republicans. We're losing Roe versus Wade because of Democrats. Democrats are their own worst enemy. And if you're listening to this podcast and you didn't vote for Hillary Clinton, or you spent months trying to tear her down 
before ultimately voting for her. It's on you because you created the United States that elected Donald Trump and gave him the opportunity to appoint three far-right, radically conservative justices to the Supreme Court. You knew it was a possibility, and you did it anyways. Listen, with that, I want to thank you for listening to what is a, an unusually long one-man monologue for the More Perfect Union. As I said, next week I will be rejoined by Greg Matusak, Ward Anderson, and other friends of the podcast, and we'll get back to our, our typical format, which is real debate without the hate. Mm. Until then, this is Kevin Kelton saying thanks for being a listener. We hope you are having a great summer. And we look forward to a great fall and a great year of More Perfect Union podcasts and your continued loyalty. Thanks for listening. Mm